let's uh, continue our discussion about the two methods we studied conditional gradient method and gradient projection method conditional gradient and gradient projection methods okay so the goal is to solve the problem minimize fx x is in capital x capital x in rn convex okay the function f need not be convex and what do we know so far well if we want to use conditional gradient then we run so the first thing we know uh, the set of feasible directions <coughs> set of feasible directions at xk is x minus xk x in capital X so these are the set of directions and we want to find the direction in which we want to descend that is the function evaluated along that direction is strictly lower than the function at xk itself so we came up with two ideas the first idea was conditional gradient where your xk plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k x bar k minus xk and your x bar k equals arg min of x in x gradient of f at xk transpose x minus xk Okay, that was conditional gradient method and then we talked about gradient projection method where again the goal is xk plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k x bar k minus xk but now x bar k is found out in a very different fashion x bar k equals Yes. Um, this might be a silly question, but have, did we establish sort of a, um, a like a, just a heuristic understanding of what these two rules are doing? So, like for the conditional gradient case, we're saying find the x that minimizes that inner prop. Right. So, in minimizing means we're not just accepting zero as an answer, right? We're accepting yes. negative numbers. Yes. Yes. So what is that saying? Is that saying that find the direction that is most anti-parallel to the gradient? Yeah, that's what you are saying. Okay. Yeah, that's so what you are saying. So, of, is it kind of like steepest descent then? This is the best that you can get with the steepest descent, okay. except that you are no longer restricted to go in all directions. Okay. So this is the best within the constraint that is provided to you, which is to find a direction within this set, right? Okay. right? Uh, so this is, well, you know, it's very difficult for me to say that this is imitating gradient descent and this is not, yeah. okay? Both of them are trying to imitate gradient descent, but in a very different fashion, right? Um, if you were an unconstrained situation, if you solve this problem, your x is rn, and therefore the solution to this is negative of gradient of fx. In this case, 
the projection is actually xk minus sk gradient of fxk. Plug it in here, and what you get is xk plus alpha k multiplied by sk multiplied by negative gradient of fx. So in the case of unconstrained optimization, both of them actually is exactly gradient descent okay. with no difference whatsoever. So in, again, thinking you know, heuristically, yes. in both of these cases, we're trying to get as close as we can to the opposite of the gradient. Yes, okay. yes. That's what you are trying to do. Okay, so one thing we did not cover in the previous uh, class was how do you pick sk and alpha k here, right? So we know how to pick alpha k in general, which is constant, diminishing, Armio's rule, blah, blah, blah. You can run all of that to find an appropriate value of alpha k here. But in this case, now you have to pick another parameter, sk. So how do you pick sk? So how to pick sk and alpha k. So the options are, of course you can do mix and match, right? But I'm going to write a few options just to be, uh, sk is constant, alpha k comes from minimization, actually limited minimization, because you have to be in zero one or you can pick Armijo's rule. Again, you have to pick alpha k between zero and one. The second option is sk chosen according to Armijo's rule along projection arc and alpha k equals 1. So what is Armijo's rule along projection arc? Yes, yes, yes. So, yes. So, what is Armijo's rule along projection arc? So, let me denote some notation. X bar K of S is X, XK minus the gradient projection. And then, you want to pick S or pick pick S equals, SK equals S beta raised to MK, where MK is the smallest natural number that satisfies F of XK This is exactly Armijo's rule, uh, but now you have a projection to take care of. Okay, so 
when alpha k equals 1, your xk plus 1 is exactly equal to x bar k. Okay. So you pick sk according to this. Uh, if this condition is satisfied, so you pick m equals 0. Check whether this condition is satisfied. If not, increase the value of m to 1. So now you have s beta. Check whether this condition is satisfied or not, and then so on, until this condition is satisfied. As soon as it's satisfied, you get out of the while loop, and then you pick the value of mk accordingly, and then you substitute sk, and then take the next step. So what this is essentially trying to do, here is my constraint set, here is my xk, here is negative gradient of fxk, so I first pick a value of s, let's say s equals or So this is just S. Xk minus S gradient F Xk. I'm going to project it and check whether the this is my this would be my x bar k but with m equals zero. Check whether the difference of the value of function at this point and this point satisfies this condition. Okay. If not, I'm going to reduce the value of s. So this is my xk minus s beta gradient of fxk. Project it. This is my x bar k1. Okay. The condition is, again we need to check whether the condition is satisfied or not and keep taking a higher value of m if the condition is not satisfied. Okay. So what you are doing, you are essentially traversing along this arc okay this is the arc so you are you pick a very far away va value in the beginning and then if that doesn't work then you go back a little bit if it, that doesn't work then you go back a little bit more and so on so you're essentially traversing along this projection arc and that's why this is known as Armio's rule along projection arc so this is the arc this whole thing is the arc Yes. So, isn't that going to require us to you know, iter iteratively solve the optimization problem to then solve another optimization problem? So, where would this approach give us significant gains enough of that optimization problem eventually is working? So, remember, yes, that's a very good point. So, projection is if you're trying to project a point onto a convex set, then you're essentially trying to solve an optimization problem. And, uh, and what we did in, when, we, when we reviewed some of the applications of projection theorem, we found that there are some sets on which projection is extremely efficient, right? So if your projection, if your set is like a box or a sphere, projection is very efficient and therefore in that situation, this is not really adding a lot of computational overhead. If your set is extremely weird like an ellipsoid or something where projection is very computationally intensive, then this will not make any sense, okay? Because you have to pick, so remember in this particular situation, you are taking the projection so many times in order to find an op optimal value of SK at every point of time. So within this iteration, you're actually doing a lot of projection and function evaluation. So you, this better be extremely efficient for this kind of algorithm to make some sense, okay? Uh, so box constraint, this makes absolute sense. Uh, sphere makes absolute sense. 
what else inequality like the co cone constraint so x greater than or equal to 0 this makes absolute sense okay because in all those cases projection is very simple to implement okay now what are what are the things that we have learned so far uh, in this situation I am trying to solve another optimization problem in order to find x bar k and this optimization problem better be efficient. So this is a linear objective function over a convex set. If it is efficient to solve, use this method. If it is not efficient to solve, then use gradient projection where you have to do projection, but then the projection has to be efficient to solve. So there is no rule of thumb which algorithm would be better, so you might have to try out for a given problem, you might have to try out different approaches in order to figure out which one is going to work best. So for the options for what you said on the uh, uh, projection are all, all made sense, you listed all the versions we have closed forms for, so they essentially wouldn't be an iterative optimization problem. Right. Are there any spaces that you could give an example of where it does in fact wind up being another optimization problem, but it is still of, su of sufficient use that that approach makes sense, or is it, if it is actually an optimization problem, it won't make sense? That's a good point. So, so in which case you will have to, it will take a lot of time for you to do projection. What, what, what could be one example of that? So let me, let me think of one such example where it might be difficult. So I have a sphere and I have a box and I'm in the intersection of these two sets. Okay, so now there is a problem because the actual set looks something like okay, it has a very pretty weird shape, even though it's a convex set, it has a pretty weird shape and so projection onto this set might require you to check iteratively various conditions. So you have a point, you project it onto this box, you project it onto this sphere, you see that both these points are actually outside the actual set. And so, so then you have to actually solve the real optimization problem in order to project it onto this particular set. I, I, I don't quite know how you would even solve that optimization problem. Maybe you could use some of the techniques we will study later on to solve that kind of optimization problem. Another problem where projection is very hard to solve, very hard to get is AX less than equal to B. Okay, so if I give you a point outside this set and I ask you to project that point onto this set, okay, so what is AX less than equal to B? It actually looks like like a set that looks almost like this. This goes all the way to infinity, this goes all the way to infinity, okay? And so if you have to, if you have a point that you want to project onto this set, it's very difficult. And I'll ask you to solve this problem in your next assignment uh, using an iterative method uh, to find the projection. Incidentally, in order to find the projection, you will use this method, <laughs> okay? so you get to do a projection onto this set using this method. So not very, n not a lot of fun, but that's what you can do in this situation. So for the second uh, option, we require x to be closed, right? Uh, which one? Our, our convex set has to be closed. Oh yeah, of course, closed. And that's for the projection? Does it have to be in the first case too? No, it has to be closed all the time, otherwise you may not have a solution. Okay. Yeah. You know, the thing is, in most of the optimization class, I'm going to implicitly assume that a solution exists. Somehow you can show that. The easiest way to show that is your set is compact. Okay, convex and closed and not convex. Convex is not important. It has to be closed and it has to be bounded. And then you can show that the solution exists. 
but that means I assume you know what a compact set means, right? So not everyone may know what a compact set means. Okay. Any further questions on these two methods? Okay. So now I'll tell you that, so one thing that we have discussed so far is gradient projection makes perfect sense if projection is an easy operation. But we haven't discussed when conditional gradient method would make sense. So let me give you some intuition as to when conditional gradient method seems to fail and when it might succeed. Okay, so now I have a set that looks something like this. So everything below these lines is part of my set capital X. I'm standing here at XK and my gradient of FXK is in this direction. So can, uh, can someone tell me if I try to solve this, so this is a linear constraint, so this, this problem would look like, so, so my x is essentially ax less than or equal to b constraint and <clears throat> my objective function will be minimize gradient fxk transpose x minus xk such that ax less than equal to b, okay? This is a linear programming problem. This problem is actually equivalent to minimize gradient fxk transpose x such that ax is less than equal to b. The two problems are equivalent. Can someone tell me why? Equivalent in the sense that the argument doesn't change. So let me write argument because the argument doesn't change for the two problems. Can someone explain the reason why the argument doesn't change for these two problems? Right. It all. Right. All, so it's not going to play into the selection. Path. Yes. It's just a linear offset. Yes. So this, so what he's saying is, if you look at this particular expression, I can write it as gradient of f x k transpose x minus gradient of f x k transpose x k, and this part is a constant. Why constant? Because it doesn't depend on x. X is the variable in this optimization problem. So I have a function of the variable and a constant, but we know that the constant doesn't participate in the optimization problem. So we could just drop this constant and we get this optimization problem. Okay? That's why the argument doesn't change because you're, all you're doing is just removing a constant from the objective function. So now, it is a property of a linear program like this that a solution, so if you run a linear program like this on a computer, typically the solution would be at the, bound, at the uh, edge, okay, at the corners. So these two are the corners and the solution would be at the corners, not at the middle of a uh, line segment. Okay, that's just the property of linear program that if a solution exists, there will be a solution at the one of the corners and therefore most of the linear programming solvers would try to find a solution at the corner, okay? That's just the property of linear program. Now, okay, so that part is clear. So this is a linear program. In this particular situation, if a solution exists, either you, the output of this argument problem would be either this 
or this okay not somewhere in between now given that your gradient is in this direction your xk sorry x star would probably be here somewhere somewhere along this line okay sorry this is not the gradient this is the negative of gradient so if you try to solve this problem it will turn out that you will get this as a solution okay so this would be your x bar of k okay so let's go back again this is the problem i need to solve in order to find x bar k i know that this problem is equivalent to this problem as far as the argument is concerned uh, and this problem is exactly a linear program from the property of linear program and the solvers i know that the solution that i'm going to get will be one of these two corners okay now if this is the direction of negative gradient of fxk most likely i'm going to get a solution of this particular optimization problem as this x bar k and then according to this update rule i am going to go in this direction i'll probably pick a point somewhere here so this will be my xk plus alpha k x bar k minus xk right and then i'm going to try and find out what's the gradient at this point and that negative of gradient would be would be along this direction in which case when i solve the argument problem i'm going to get this point okay and this will be my x bar k plus 1 So what's happening? It's just throwing us around in a zigzag path. Okay, this algorithm is throwing us around in a zigzag path. And what's the reason? The reason is that the solution lies in the middle of a line segment that is too long. Okay. So it has yeah. Yes, if your alpha k is very small, then you will probably converge. Okay, um, but it has been shown. But but then you will take a very long time to converge because you are going in an extremely zigzag path, right? So you are just exploring the space without really converging to the solution early on. So it has been shown earlier that if your constraint set has a positive curvature so what is a positive curvature looks like something like this okay so the path the the edge is always curving so if it has a positive curvature then the conditional gradient method works very well why because now if you are solving a linear program in the same case you will probably get x bar k as this point instead of getting a point somewhere here okay so the conditional gradient method makes sense when number of constraints are very large which very large or boundary has positive curvature okay so either your number of constraints in this convex set should be very very large so this a matrix should have lots of rows okay 
that is a case where it makes sense or the boundary has a positive curvature. So something like a sphere would make sense. Yes? So you defined positive curvature by inspection and of just drawing the curve up there on the board. Is there a more computational test for that if we don't have uh, a, a X that we yeah. can easily inspect? Yeah. So, uh, Yes, so in that, so you want a computational method to find what has positive curvature. So when you look at the surface and you take the second derivative of the surface, it has to be strictly positive definite or strictly negative definite. That's, that's what it means to have a curvature. Okay, so that's what you want. Any other question? Okay, so those are the two general purpose methods for, um, for solving uh, optimization problem of this type. There is one more method that tries to imitate Newton's method. Okay, so let's study that. So we know that Newton's method is extremely fast for unconstrained optimization. So we would like to extend it to the constrained case, so how do we how do we do that? So constrained Newton's method, your x bar k is argument of x in x. Can someone tell me what should be the interior, in, what should be inside this argument? Remember, what does Newton's method for the unconstrained case do? So it essentially tries to figure out the second order Taylor series approximation around the point xk. So I'm standing at xk. I have this nonlinear function. I am going to take the second order approximation of this function and I am going to find the descent direction that minimizes the second order approximation of the function. Okay, so in the unconstrained case, Newton's method uh, minimizes or computes a direction that minimizes second order Taylor approximation. Okay. So now we want to use the same idea for the constraint case. So all I need to do is find out the second order Taylor's approximation. So what do we do? So the first term is gradient of fxk transpose x minus xk plus 1 over 2 x minus xk transpose second derivative x minus xk. Okay, so this is 
essentially trying to imitate the same idea for the unconstrained case. This is the second order Newton's approximation around xk and I want to find a feasible direction that minimizes this whole thing. It turns out that if you pick an appropriate value of alpha k, <coughs> this will have superlinear convergence property. Can we simplify uh, that like we did uh, the previous function using the fact that xk is going to be a constant to pull out the... Yes, uh, you can do that. So would, wouldn't that just be a much simpler argument to write down then? Uh, Yes, it will be much simpler but difficult to understand. Okay. Yeah, I think it will just be difficult to understand. This is much easier to understand because you kind of see that this is a second order Taylor's approximation. Now, so this has superlinear convergence property for an appropriate choice of alpha k. So either alpha k is small or it's decreasing or whatever, um, it will convert super linearly to x star. One question that I might uh, add to you guys or throw at you is what essentially is this trying to do? In the sense of, I want to frame this question very uh, very well. So you can understand this particular Newton's method also as a as a scaled gradient projection method. Okay, so this is an instance of an instance of scaled gradient projection method. So what is scaled gradient projection method? Well, in, in this method, what you do is you transform the coordinate axis. You rotate it, you squeeze it, you elongate it along certain directions. So if you scale the coordinate axis, you essentially change the objective function, you change the norm, over which you are trying to solve the problem. You change the projection operator, okay? And that leads to what is known as a scaled gradient projection method. So let me just write down something, some expression, so that will give you a food for thought. So you change x to hk raised to 1 half or negative 1 half y and then you do gradient projection on minimize over y of h k y which is defined as f of h k minus half y where this h k is actually the second derivative of the function. Okay, so remember any sort of matrix multiplication is actually going to change the way coordinate axis look. Okay, so it's either going to rotate, not either. It's going to rotate the coordinate axis and it's going to squeeze it and scale it along certain direction. So that's why it's called the scaled gradient projection method. Okay, so that's what this method is trying to achieve. So you can pick any other value of hk. So here the value of hk is the second derivative, but you can pick any other value of hk. Okay, and that would give you a corresponding scaled gradient projection method. I don't quite know what the benefit of scaled gradient projection method is, uh, but perhaps one instance of scaled gradient projection method, which is the constrained Newton's method, seems to perform very well in practice. Okay. Yes. In practice, where is this used? Oh, uh, 
You mean Newton's method or this method? No, the scale gradient projection method. Uh, is there an example of a problem where this approach works rather well when we don't just say HK is... So, is, uh, uh, so I don't know where it is used, okay? I just know that Newton's method, which is an instance of the scale gradient projection method, has superlinear convergence property. Okay. Now, one could argue, I am going to compute HK according to the DFP or BFGS method, you know, quasi-Newton's method. So there, the HK was an approximation of the second derivative, right? So one could argue that instead of taking the second derivative, I am going to use some sort of second order approximation of the second derivative and use that for scaled gradient projection method. Hopefully that might inherit some of the superlinear convergence property of the Newton's method, just like it happened for the quasi-Newton method. Any question? Now, in most cases, one could show that all these three algorithms, not most cases, but in case, in appropriate, under appropriate uh, assumptions, one can show that these algorithms converge to optimal X star. Uh, the convergence proofs are there in the book, but uh, they are pretty long and uh, tedious, so we will not be covering it in the class. Right? And mostly this class or this entire course is going to introduce you to the algorithms that are used to solve, but we won't go into the convergence proof uh, uh, that often. O only for some special cases we'll go into the convergence proof, otherwise we won't. But the idea is very simple in order to prove these convergences, is to prove that the descent directions are gradient related in some sense. Okay? And so as long as they are gradient related, you will prove that it will converge to one of the stationary points. Okay. Now, these are general purpose algorithms where x could be any arbitrary convex closed set and your function f could be arbitrarily, arbitrary looking non-convex function. Um, but in, in practice, in a lot of cases, you have constraints like the following. So we saw in the electricity market case, we saw in the multi-commodity multi -commodity case, the constraints were of the form Ax less than equal to B or Ax equal to b, x greater than equal to 0, right? These are the two constraint sets that appear in many problems because you want to optimize over quantities that cannot be negative but must satisfy a certain constraint, flow constraint, it could be demand equals to supply constraint or you could have some bounded, so your x would lie in some sort of bounded set given by the, by these expressions. Okay, the bounds are given by these expressions. So even though these algorithms certainly would work for these two constraint sets, the question is, can we develop better algorithms than these three algorithms that we talked about? Can we develop better algorithms to solve problems where the constraint sets look like this, okay? And it turns out that there are two such methods. One is manifold suboptimization method, which in the context of linear function is known as simplex method. How many of you have heard of simplex method? A few of you, okay? So one is manifold suboptimization method for solving problems optimization problems over this set, and then an affine scaling method, which is used for solving optimization problems where the set constraint set looks something like this. So this is, these are both linear constraint sets. So this is also linear and this is also linear constraints. 
So what we are going to do next is instead of talking about some general purpose optimization algorithms which work for arbitrary sets, we are going to specialize the set and study two specific algorithms. One is manifold suboptimization and the other one is a fine scaling method. Okay. A little bit of history. So, World War II, let's go back to World War II. Okay, people wanted to deploy resources on the battlefields and they had resource constraints and they had the cost of moving troops around or moving resources around and they wanted to solve this problem of how much resources to put at what places with the minimum cost and maximum benefit and there was a scientist called Kantorovich, a Russian mathematician who came up with this idea of solving linear program. Okay. So he came up with the formulation of linear program and he, maybe he came up with simplex method or somebody else around that time came up with simplex method for solving linear optimization problems. So linear optimization problems are, I want to minimize C transpose X such that AX is less than equal to B. Okay. And then of course the sim, so that was known as simplex method. Uh, and I'm talking about 1940s. I don't know when in 1940s, but somewhere in 1940s, simplex method was devised to solve problems of this type. And so manifold suboptimization method suboptimization method is an instance of simplex method. Okay. So the first thing that we should know Okay. So what's the idea? Let me let me discuss the idea first. So ax less than equal to b looks like uh, I want to draw a very nice looking 3D diagram which I've been using for last three years. So let's say this is a constraint set. Okay, this constraint set, so everything is uh, plain. Okay, so this is a house surrounded by plain. So this is your AX less than equal to B constraint. And I start with some point, I don't know, somewhere here. This is my initial point X naught. And I want to get to the optimal point that looks somewhere here, X star. What, uh, what do you think would be the most efficient way to go from this initial point X naught to the final point X star where you want to go? Okay, so come up with two not to, but come up with some idea, okay? Throw some ideas at me. What would be an ideal way to go from X naught to X star efficiently? Any thoughts? So, yeah. Try, try to travel through the interior of the set as directly to X star as we can. So try to find the shortest path. Yes, yeah, so you want to find the shortest path that goes like this, right? Through the interior of the set itself. Okay, so we don't quite know where X star is, so we cannot really find the shortest path, but certainly we can find a curved path that goes to X star, okay? 
That's one way. So how do you find with, how do you curve it? Well, I'm going to go closer to the boundary, but I'm still in the interior, okay? I'm going to go closer to the boundary and I'm going to track along the boundary and get to X star. Okay, so that's a good, good point. So that's one way of doing it because I know where the boundary is. I don't know which way to go, but I know where the boundary is, so I'm going to go along the boundary and get to the point X star. What's the other way? Okay, the other way in order to go efficiently is to go at these edges and then just travel around the edges in order to get to X star. Okay, just along the edges. And then the question is, which edge to go to? Which, which side to go to? So once you reach this edge, should you go in this direction or should you go in this direction? If you reach this point, should you go in this direction or should you go in this direction? And so on, right? So you have a lot of questions to answer. But in some cases, those, those questions can be answered very, very efficiently. And those are the two methods so, that we are going to talk about. So in the manifold suboptimization method, we are going to go along the edges, right? And at every point, we will figure out which of the edges is the optimal edge to go on. And we'll, we'll go along the edges, and then we'll get to X star efficiently. In the other method, a fine scaling method, that's an interior point method. And you are going to go closer to the boundary, and then you will travel along the boundary. Being in the interior of the set, you will travel along the boundary and get to the optimal point. Okay, so those are the two very high level description of the ideas. One is interior point, go through the interior of the set. The other one is manifold suboptimization or simplex method, which is going along the edges. <coughs> okay, so you are exactly at the boundary, but not just any boundary, you are exactly at the edges and then you are moving along those edges. Okay. So in order to start the description of manifold suboptimization, I want to define what is known as set of active constraints. So set of active constraints. So I'm at xk and I define axk equals to j such that aj transpose xk equals bj. And my matrix A is A1 transpose AM transpose. Okay, so when I'm here at this point, I have one constraint of this particular plane that is active, the other constraint is that plane the, on the other side of the house. So that constraint is active and so there are two active constraints at this point, okay? There is one active constraint at this point because that's just being on the plane itself. So there's one active constraint, two active constraints and there are three active constraints at this point because all there are three planes that are intersecting at this particular point, okay? In practice, of course, the way you find the set of active constraint is to take the difference between the two, and as long as they are less than 10 raised to minus six, the constraint is pretty much active, okay? So if you have to implement it in MATLAB, you have to check the difference and make sure it is less than some very small number. Now, at, this, at, at that point, xk, what are the set of feasible directions? So what are D could lie in. So in which direction D can I go so that I don't violate any of the other constraints? Okay, so what are the set of active directions? So I have to be uh, 
Okay, so let me write it. So d a x plus d should be less than equal to b. Okay. I, I'll give you this as a homework, which is think about it, and we will meet in the class on Friday. Uh, of course, next class is quiz one, so prepare well for the quiz. It's going to be on convex set, convex function, blah, blah, blah. Right? You know what the topics are covered in the quiz. But what I want you to think for Friday's class is what are the set of directions D in which you can go without violating this constraint. Okay? So that's your homework. Uh, we'll meet on Friday. Next class, I won't be here. I'm going to DC for a meeting. So my uh, PhD students will be here. They will proctor the quiz. And there shouldn't be any problem with the questions in the quiz. Otherwise, you can ask them if you see any, if you have a problem in the paper, you should just ask them and they'll be able to answer. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you.